Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to One Civil Law, where, as always, we learn through the misfortunes of others. I'm your host on Civil Law, and I woke up to some interesting Twitter news regarding something that happened at Stanford Law School on the 9th. So this is the day before yesterday. Somehow did not capture my attention yesterday. But making the rounds today, the Federalist Society, which is a major player in law, they are one of the major organizations often perceived as right wing, but the Federalist Society and started by Justice Scalia, incidentally, at Yale way back when in the day, I believe this is when he was still Judge Scalia, but still, or maybe it was even before that. But anyway, Scalia was one of the founders of the Federalist Society in his early days of his practice, as it were. And this society was created and has become a major influencer in law. And it exists pretty much at all the law schools and is often perceived as right wing. And they had federal judge, U.S. Circuit Judge Kyle Duncan. They invited him as a guest to speak at an event on March the 9th. And he decided to come to Stanford Law to talk about stuff. So you have a sitting Fifth Circuit Justice or Fifth Circuit Judge, Court of Appeals Judge, and he's invited to Stanford Law School by the Federalist Society, which is a major player in law schools, to speak about law stuff to law students. This seems like, you know, an excellent opportunity for everybody. You know, you understand his thoughts and thinking and learn a little bit about stuff and all the rest of it, but, well... It, it didn't it didn't necessarily go smoothly because the associate dean of the law school, a woman named Tyron Steinbach, decided that she wanted to interrupt the event and give some thoughts. The associate dean of diversity, equity, and inclusion had some thoughts she wanted to give that were really, really important before this jurist could address the law students. So what we're going to do, we're going to, first of all, just listen to this entire thing because I want you to see it as it happened. This is an eight minute clip. So we will offer an eight minute clip without commentary. And then we will go over a transcript of her remarks and address from there. But I think it's important for you to see how little respect they give a sitting federal court of appeals judge in Law school. Great. Let's do that. So this is Judge Duncan at Stanford. And this is an eight minute clip and we will just watch it without further comment. So let's listen on. Who work here, who study here, and who live. 
live here, your advocacy, your opinions from the bench, land as absolute disenfranchisement of their rights so and you, does land. So Let so me <laughs> directly their people, humans, their families, and their communities. And I'm uncomfortable, and it's uncomfortable to say this to you as a person. It's uncomfortable to say that for many people here, your work has caused harm, has caused, has caused harm. And I know that must be uncomfortable to hear. I know that must be. Let me please finish. And I want to give you space to finish your remarks too, Judge Duncan. I'm also uncomfortable because Many of the people in the room here I have come to care for. Um, and at, in my role at this university, my job is to create a space of belonging for all people in this institution. And that is hard and messy and not easy. And the answers are not black or white or right or wrong. This is actually part of the creation of belonging. And it doesn't feel comfortable, and it doesn't always feel safe, but there are always places of safety, and there is always an intention from this administration to make sure you all can be in a place where you feel fully you can be here, learn, grow into the amazing advocates and lawyers and leaders that you're going to be. I'm also uncomfortable because it is my job to say you are invited into this space. You are absolutely welcome in this space in this space that people learn and again live. I really do wholeheartedly welcome you because me and many people in this administration do absolutely believe in free speech. We believe that it is necessary. We believe that the way to address speech that feels abhorrent, that feels harmful, that literally denies the humanity of people, uh -huh. one way to do that is with more speech and not less. That's and what Justice Brandeis wrote around. long Since ago. You or send to the student group that invited you here. That is hard, that is uncomfortable, and that is a policy and a principle that I think is worthy of defending even in this time, even in this time. And again, I still ask, is the juice worth the squeeze? What does that mean? I mean, is it worth the pain that this causes and the division that it causes? Do you have something so incredible, important to say about Twitter and guns and COVID that that is worth this? impact on the division of these people who have sat next to each other for years, who are going through what is the battle of law school together so that they can go out into the world and be advocates. And this is the division that's caused. When I say, is the juice worth the squeeze? That's what I'm asking. Is this worth it? And I hope so, and I'll stay for your remarks to see, because I do want to know your perspective. I am not, you know, in the business of wanting to either shut down speech because I do know that if they come for this group today, they will come for the group that I am part of tomorrow. I do believe that and I understand why people feel like the harm is so great that we might need to reconsider those policies and luckily they're in a school where they can learn the advocacy skills to advocate for those changes. I hope that you have something to share with us that we can learn from. I hope you can learn too while you're in this learning institution. I hope you can look to the spectacle of the, and the noise to the people holding these signs, the people who are here to learn, the people who just like you absolutely are fighting for, working for freedom, just to be free, to be themselves. That is what they are here for. They are here because they feel harmed, not just by your speech. If it was just words, that would be one thing. You have authority and you have power to make decisions that impact the lives of millions. And I hope if you learn anything, if you can listen through, you can listen through your partisan lens, the hyper-political lens, and just look and see human beings who are asking you to take care. And like all guests on our campus, we ask that you come with good intentions and respect. And I do want to hear your remarks, and I do want to say thank you for protecting the free speech that we value here of our speakers and of our protesters. And I want to remind you all of one thing. I chose to be here today. You all chose to be here today. Many people go before Judge Duncan 
who do not necessarily choose to be there. And yeah. they have to listen yeah. to everything he says. Literally thousands of people. You have a choice. You do not need to stay here if this is not where you want to be. You can stay here if this is where you want to be right now. But make that choice. If you do choose to stay here, I do think we should give space um, to hear what Judge Duncan has to say. And I hope that also you will take question and answer and comment section to say what you need to say and to ask the questions you need to ask. I'm really grateful to be in this institution. I look out and I don't ask what is going on here. I look out and I say, I'm glad this is going on here. <laughs> Yes, the sign was upside down, people, but apparently that doesn't matter over here in, uh, in Stanford land. Once again, sitting Fifth Circuit Justice, Judge, Court of Appeals, out of Texas and other states. He was invited by the Federalist Society at Stanford. The title of the talk was The Fifth Circuit in Conversation with the Supreme Court, COVID, Guns, and Twitter. That was the title of the talk. That was what he's gonna talk about. And those are three subjects the Fifth Circuit has spoken about recently that are notable in law. And this is an interesting topic, right? Uh, this is an interesting topic, because here's a Fifth Circuit judge who's like, well, you know, the Fifth Circuit has made some notable rulings recently on the topics of COVID, guns, and Twitter. And here's how the Supreme Court is or is not responding to that, and how's here, here's how we're responding to them, right? It's a conversation, right? The Fifth Circuit's in conversation with the Supreme Court as it's in conversation with the district courts. Right, and they're having a they're having a legal discussion, and so he was going to talk about these these three ideas, which seems like a very reasonable thing to talk about, and he could express his views on these issues that are notable. His talk apparently ended about forty minutes early, so even with all this, it ended early. Stanford Law School has a policy incidentally, that they are supposed to give freedom of speech. They, they, they give lip service to freedom of speech, which is one of the reasons that the dean was saying some of the things that she was saying. Because the dean is supposed to give effect to Stanford's policy. But Stanford is like not really supporting its own policy because 
it's like, well, we're not supposed to heckle speakers. We're not supposed to stop them from speaking. But here the dean of DEI, Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, that's her title, is here to interrupt this speech by a sitting jurist who is apparently the Stanford law students have no interest in hearing from, which is odd because they're in a law school and he is a sitting appeals court judge. So that's all a bunch of stupid. I thought also we could go over some of her, some of what the Dean said. This has been thoughtfully transcribed by fire an organization that I like, I believe they now, their name now stands for freedom. What does their name actually stand for them? Cause they changed it recently. Uh, foundation for individual rights and expression. So they recently changed their name, like in the last month or something. So I couldn't quite remember it. Foundation for individual rights and expression. I liked it better when they were foundation for individual rights in, in education, but yeah. So April, uh, April 18th. So they haven't even like had their grand gala reveal yet. So yeah, they're celebrating their new advocacy on April 18th. That's how new it is. They still haven't had their big party where they're announcing the whole thing or whatever. Anyways, that's not really important right now. What is important is the transcript of the remarks that the associate dean for diversity, equity, and inclusion, Tyrene. Tyron Steinbach gave, and I thought we could go over this and comment. She says, is it worth the pain that it causes and the division it causes? Is it, is it worth the pain and division of having a sitting justice or sitting judge of the fifth circuit talk about COVID guns and Twitter, three topics that have been recently notable in fifth circuit jurisprudence is it is it worth him talking about those subjects to a law school she continues do you have something so incredibly important to say about twitter and guns and covid that it's worth this impact on the division of these people who have sat next to each other for years who are going through what is the battle of law school together so they can go out into the world and be advocates and this is the division it causes I mean, yes, if not for the least of reasons, the most practical, agree with him or disagree with him. He is a sitting judge on the Fifth Circuit. His pronouncements have some interesting, notable impacts in the real world. As lawyers, this is helpful to know. And you, of course, can disagree with him. He's not God. And it would be helpful to understand his positions if you're going to disagree with him. Because maybe you can convince him he's wrong. It's happened before. Judges change their minds. Presented with different arguments. It's helpful to understand where he is. Or to understand the flaws of his arguments so that you can appeal to other judges. Appeal in the sense being more of a colloquial sense because not really literal appeal. But you can, you can advocate to other judges in other circuits who might express different pronouncements. And then the Supreme Court would be in a position to review that. And then you'd want to know how to talk to the Supreme Court so you can get the law changed. So it, no matter how you slice it, it's helpful to understand the law as it currently exists. I disagree with the Supreme Court about decisions. We've discussed these before. Worker v. Filburn and Chevron versus NRDC are my favorite ones to complain about. But, and I think they're wrong. But I understand they exist, and I understand the state of the law, and we have together reviewed those decisions and looked over their analysis and critiqued them. And were I ever fortunate enough to be in a position to advocate to the Supreme Court, hey, have you thought about overruling Wickard or Chevron? Understanding all those things would be really, really helpful as I'm trying to move the law like here's where the law is here's what you guys have said before here's where you were wrong you know make the better analysis 
But you can't do that without first understanding where you're at. You can't move somewhere without knowing where you are. You can't have a direction and orientation without knowing your starting point. How do you know how you are supposed to get to where you want to be if you don't know where you are? <laughs> right? So, yes, I would think that his hearing from the Fifth Circuit judge would be, would be definitely worth it. She continues. When I say, is the juice worth the squeeze, that's what I'm asking. Is this worth it? To talk to sitting law students by a sitting judge? And I hope so. And I'll save for your remarks to see. Because I do want to know your perspective. Do you, though? I'm not in the business of wanting to either shut down speech. Because I know if they come for this group today, they'll come for the group I'm part of tomorrow. I do believe that. Do you actually, though? Do you? So you would have no problem because you're not a hypocrite. You would have no problem with some associate dean or equivalent interrupting a speaker of your choice by giving remarks at the start of their speech. That would be okay with you. So when, when he comes to speak to, I don't know, whatever, the American Constitutional Society, ACS, the left-wing group, when he comes and says, well, you know, I'll, I'll let you finish and all. I'll let you finish, but I've got some remarks to give to the start of this before the ACS person can be allowed to speak. You're going to be okay with that because you were okay with it here? I don't know. She continues. I do understand why people feel like the harm is so great. We might need to reconsider those policies. So she is open to the idea of reconsidering the idea that he should be allowed to speak. Even though she believes that if they come for him, they'll come for her, she still feels like maybe they shouldn't allow him to speak. Eh. And luckily, they're in a school where they can learn the advocacy skills to advocate for those changes. Do you feel like they're learning advocacy skills to learn how to advocate for those changes right now? I hope you have something to share with us we can learn from. I hope you, too, can learn while you're in this institution of learning. Dude, condescend much? I mean, come on. It's not that judges don't have something to learn. It's not that members of the Supreme Court don't have things to learn, but could you express it in maybe a less condescending way? Jeez. I hope that you can look through the spectacle and the noise to the people holding the signs. Yeah. The people are here to learn, are they? Are they here to learn? Are you sure? The people just like you who are absolutely fighting for, working for freedom. Just to be free, to be themselves, that is what they're here for. Well, not to put too fine a point on it, but strictly speaking, that's not what they're there for. That may be what they ultimately do with the thing, but that's not really the thing at the moment. The thing is to learn the reasoning skills of a lawyer. Right, Not even the practice of a lawyer, because as has been famously said, we're a law school, not a lawyer school. And so law school does F all to teach you how to be a lawyer. It tells you a lot about how to think like one and reason like one. The actual practice of law is still more a thing that you learn on the job than in the law school, for better or worse. These people are there not to learn how to advocate. Principally, these people are there principally to learn how to reason and think, particularly think in from both sides of any perspective or multiple sides of any perspective. And this incidentally is a good tip for all lawyers of any variety, 
Like you can be the most non-ideological lawyer known to man. I don't know what kind of cases you're taking, but you know, traffic cases or hit and run cases or whatever. It is a really good skill for a lawyer to at least try to think about what the other side might be thinking or doing or think about weaknesses in your own case. How would I advocate against myself? How would I undermine my own argument? Right? To at least try to buttress yourself. Like a general preparing a castle against a, against an attack. You may not think of everything. The other guy's trying to think of everything. You know they're trying to think of everything. So you try to think of everything first. And try to think of contingency plans and things like that. And then someone outthinks someone else. And someone wins. But you try. You try to think of things. You try to look for weak spots. You try to think about how do I undermine myself? How do I argue against myself? How do I beat my own argument? How do I look at this from a different point of view? And you may ultimately use that to be an advocate, but that's not really what law school is for. Law school is really there to teach you how to think. They are here because they feel you've been harmed, not just by your speech. If it was just words, that would be one thing. I don't think that would be dispositive because we've seen how they respond to just words. You have authority and you have the power to make decisions that affect the lives of millions. And I hope if you've learned anything, if you can listen through, if you can listen through your partisan lens, uh, how are you doing listening through your partisan lens right about now? Or do you not think that you have one? You think your lens is nonpartisan. Okay. Also, his lens isn't strictly speaking partisan. Because partisan implies party, and that's not really how judges work. Judges work based on legal principles. They don't work based on party affiliation. Those things sometimes align. But not always, especially the right-wing ones, it seems, have a tendency to do that more because they're actually loyal to legal principles, not party. And so you'll see judges rule against their own interests, especially right-wing ones, it seems to me. But yeah, partisan isn't quite the right way of putting it. There is an underlying legal philosophy that he's adopted, but that philosophy is not based on party. It's based on philosophy. The degree to which the party does or does not meet that philosophy, you know, is going to dictate a lot of the answer, but it's not really strictly speaking partisan, but okay. If you can listen through, if you can listen through your partisan lens, your hyper political lens, dude, are you one to talk and just look and see human beings who are asking you to take care. And like all guests on our campus, we ask you come with good intentions and respect. I feel the respect. I feel the respect just oozing from you right now. If this is what respect looks like. And I do want to hear your remarks. And I do want to say thank you for protecting the free speech that we value here of our speakers and of our protesters. And I'll remind you all of one thing. I chose to be here today. You all chose to be here today. Many people who go before Judge Duncan don't choose to be there, and they have to listen to everything he says. Literally thousands of people, you have a choice. You do not need to stay here if this is not where you want to be. You can stay here right now if this is where you want to be, but make that choice. I mean, you would think that an associate dean of a law school would go a little bit out of their way to encourage and extol people to stay. Of course they have a choice, but it's a law school. He's a judge on the Fifth Circuit. And you would, you would think that you would encourage and extol people to stay. Aren't we so privileged, literally, aren't we privileged to have this jurist 
come to our law school and talk about these interesting topics and also talk about his perception of his relationship with the Supreme Court. And depending on what that looks like, it might raise some interesting questions. Like, here's how you perceive your relationship with the Supreme Court. Okay, is that the correct way for a district judge to perceive their relationship with you? Might be an interesting question. And maybe the answer is yes, or maybe the answer is no. But it'd be an interesting question. Because like, well, here's how I perceive my relationship with the Supreme Court. Here's how I perceive what we're doing. Is that how you perceive district courts? Is that how they should perceive it? If no, why not? What's different? I, you would think the dean would go out of their way, but apparently not so much for some reason. If you choose to stay here, I do think we should give space to hear what Judge Duncan has to say. His speech ended 40 minutes early, so apparently not so much. And I also hope you'll take the question, answer, and comment session to say what you need to say and ask the questions you need to ask. At this point, if I'm Judge Duncan, I am not staying for questions and answers because it's a fool's errand. I'm really grateful to be in this institution. I look at it and I don't ask what is going on here. I look at it and say, I'm glad this is going on here. Well, thank you, Dean, for your thoughtful and insightful comments on this exciting issue. I'm not 100% sure you understood the assignment, as they say, because, yeah. Here, here's some interesting Twitter comments. Let's read some more Twitter, stupid. Apparently, David Latt writes the following. Well, I think the administration should have handled it differently. My main takeaway is I've never seen a grown man, let alone a federal judge, comport himself so poorly. Really? From the moment Judge Duncan arrived on campus, he seemed to be looking for a fight. He walked into law school filming protesters on his phone, more, looking more like a YouTuber storming the Capitol than a federal judge coming to speak. Wow, these people have no perspective. The judge lost his cool almost immediately. He started heckling back and attacking students' perspective. He might thought that maybe you would be treating him with the appropriate level of respect. <laughs> Someone accused him of taking away voting rights from black folks in a southern state. He asked the student to cite the case. While she was looking up the case, he braided her. Cite a case, cite a case, cite a case. You can't even cite a case. You really expect us to work in court. Well, when you're in court, you are expected to be able to cite things like that. So if you're going to come with an accusation, you should be ready to go. When she eventually cited the one she's referring to, he said something along the lines, was I even on that panel? When she told him he was, he moved just right along with his tirade. Lol. I ended up leaving before the end of the event, but from what I heard during Q&A, one of the students shared that she had been sexually assaulted in college and asked a point question. His response was something along the lines of nice story. Someone asked him a question about this decision, denying a pro se motion to use the petitioner's preferred pronouns, basically saying, in courts, we're supposed to show respect for judges and co-counsel. If you couldn't force other judges to use litigants' pronouns, couldn't you have shown them the person some respect and, and asked them how they wish to be addressed? Duncan's respect was, read the opinion, next question. Well, which is not particularly irrelevant because he spoke to exactly this issue. Agree with him or disagree with him, he wrote the issue. He wrote it. So it's like, couldn't he's like, well, just read what I wrote. I already spoke on this issue. Just read it. You know, it's like, couldn't you just show them print out? Just read the read the decision. It's right there for everybody, you know. When asked what he meant when he said that Obergefell would upset the civil peace, he gestured at the room of mostly queer protesters. How this person knows that is beyond me, by the way. How they know they're mostly queer. Do they wear signs or something? And implied that the disruption at the event proved his point. 
If the students should be embarrassed by their behavior during the event, which I think they probably should be, Duncan ought to be ashamed. Law students are adults and should act accordingly. Duncan is a federal judge and should also act accordingly. He did not. Wow. Exciting. Exciting. Let us look at the university's code of conduct. which speaks to at least partially this issue. This is so stupid. Stanford University is an institution dedicated to the pursuit of excellence and facilitation of environment that fosters this goal. Central to the institutional commitment is the principle of treating each university community member fairly and with respect and embracing diversity and inclusion. The university prohibits discrimination and harassment and provides equal opportunity for all community members, regardless of race, color, re religious creed, national origin, ancestry, physical or mental disability, reproductive health decision-making, mental condition, Genetic information, marital status, sex, age, sexual orientation, gender, gender identity, gender expression, military status, veteran status, or any other characteristic protected by law. I feel the levels of respect just oozing and emanating from this thing in every possible way. Once again, it is a law school. He's a sitting federal appeals court judge. He's sitting on a topic of some relevance and note, two things, but people don't want to hear from it. It is, it is truly amazing. It is truly amazing. And then we see the law students just walk out of this event. Wow. So I think Stanford Law School is a joke. That's kind of what I think. Yeah. Policy on campus disruption. Let us read the Stanford University policy on disruptions, shall we? The policy on campus, campus disruptions from 1967 states the following. Because the rights of free speech and peaceful assembly are fundamental to democratic process, Stanford firmly supports the right of all members of the university community to express their views or protest against actions and opinions with which they disagree. All members of the university also share concurrent obligations to maintain on campus an atmosphere conductive to scholarly pursuits, to preserve dignity and seriousness of the university ceremonies and public exercise and respect the rights of all individuals. The following regulations are intended to reconcile these objectives. It is a violation of university policy for a member of the faculty, staff, or student body to dis prevent or disrupt the effective carrying out of university function or approved activity, such as lectures, meetings, interviews, ceremonies, the conduct of the university business in the university office and public events, and obstruct the legitimate movement of any person about the campus or in any university building and facility. So it is against university policy to disrupt the carrying out of any approved activity, such as a lecture, such as this, which was approved. Yeah. So, and that's been the policy at Stanford apparently since 1967, but they're not so very good about following their own policy. And apparently the people that left then went to a different room and protested in a different room or had a struggle session or something. I don't know, which is their prerogative. But they disrupted this event, prevented the person from speaking, and ended early due to the disruptions. 
And the university didn't really try to go out of its way to encourage people to listen and engage with a person who actually like knows things and does this for a living. Wow. I am not sure that Stanford is really setting up. Stanford is considered normally the third best law school in the country. It is normally ranked number three behind Yale and Harvard. And uh, I don't know. And Yale has also had problems, incidentally, with not allowing people to speak at the law schools. So Yale's also done some of this stuff. So I'm not so sure the upper crust of the law schools are once they what they once were. At this point, I think I'm glad not to have gotten a degree from these people because they're complete embarrassment. So I don't. I don't really know about any of this. It's just annoying. So I guess I don't really have anything more to say about this. I just thought it was important to bring the the idiots to your attention and show you what stupid is happening. So, yeah. For the 300 of you who are currently here, by the way, thank you very, very much for you being here and enjoying me on this, this interesting way to start my Saturday. Didn't really sign up for this, but this is this is where we're at. What law school did I go to? I went to University of Akron in Ohio, which is a third tier school. So it's normally ranked about uh, somewhere between 100 and 150, depending on who's ranking it at the time. But it's really good in intellectual property, which is one of the reasons I went there. Plus, they offered me a scholarship, which was also nice. Akron, Ohio is also home to the National Inventor Center. And they have a good IP program, which was my field of interest at the time. So I went to the University of Akron in Ohio for law school. But yeah, so that's where I went. I went to Clemson for undergrad, go Tigers. So uh, yeah. Anyways, I hope you've enjoyed this, this, this stream. If you've enjoyed this stream, please remember to do all the YouTube things. Please remember to give it a like. It helps a lot. You can also retweet the link to this stream on the Twitters if you like. That helps a lot with the things and all that good stuff. I've been on civil law. Until later, my friends, I hope all is well. Cheers, my friends, and goodbye.